<laughs> okay, better be quiet then. <laughs> It'll get interesting. <laughs> Good morning, Sandra and Paul. Still there, Martin and Lee. Well, welcome everybody this morning to our service, which will include communion as part of our service this morning. Paul is uh, leading our worship today, so I will uh, hand straight over to you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Adrian. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak in English uh, this morning rather than uh, vegetable language because uh, I don't understand uh, anything about gardening or. <laughs> So anyway, it's nice to uh, to see you all and uh, good that we're here. Sorry we're a little bit late logging on, but we overran slightly at, uh, at Cary this morning. Um, I just want to uh, start by reading a, a, a couple of verses from Psalm 9, really, to sort of set the theme, the tone of our uh, worship today. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. Those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you never forsake those who seek you, O Lord. Our first uh, hymn this morning is God is our strength and refuge. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's come to God now in prayer. Just bring our time of worship to our Saviour. Father, we uh, are gathered in our houses today. Lord, although we're spread out, we are together. We are joined, we're united by our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And Lord, that mysteriously, Lord, by his Holy Spirit, we're able to come together this morning to 
worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray this morning that we might indeed worship you, Lord. Lord, free up our minds, our bodies, our souls, our whole beings, Father, to come before you in praise, in worship, in adoration, Father, because you, Lord, are a holy God, a, a God, Father, who created the whole world, who created each one of us. You are our refuge and our strength, Lord, in time of trouble. And only you, Father, can save us from our sins and from the troubles and torments, Lord, of this dark world. We just pray, Lord, this morning that we might hear your voice, that we might experience, Father, the outpouring of your spirit among each one of us today. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, those of you that uh, know me know that uh, I often get myself into sort of embarrassing situations. And I'm going to tell you a, an, what I would call an unbelievable story this morning. But those of you that know me would probably think, well, this is the typical kind of thing that uh, Paul would, uh, would do. It's very embarrassing. And Sandra's going to probably dive under the sofa uh, when I get towards the end of the story, because it's, uh, it's one of those sorts of stories, if you know what I mean. Uh, some years ago, um, when my children were very little, um, we went on a holiday to, uh, to France. And uh, whilst we were there, we decided to, uh, to do a day trip out to a town that was just a, a few miles away down the, down the road. And we were having a nice time, but unfortunately, part way during the day, I really wanted to go to the toilet. And I was absolutely bursting to go. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to France, but the toilets in France are pretty rough. Well, pretty few and far between, between you and me. And if you do manage to find a toilet, they're not very nice to go in, I'll tell you. They're very, very smelly. and. Uh, not you know I wouldn't recommend them at all so I was having a bit of a predicament really trying to find the toilet now it wouldn't have been too bad if I'd have just wanted to go for a wee but unfortunately I wanted to do a number two now I was in absolutely dire straits here and I really really didn't quite know what I was going to do I said, look, it's no good, I said. We're going to have to go back to the car. I'm just not going to last it any longer. So the four of us walked back to the car. Well, James didn't. He was in the bush. No, now. James was in the bush. He was about <laughs> two at the time. Anyway, when we got back to the car, I opened the boot, and inside the boot, I found these two items a potty and a toilet roll. <laughs> and I'll leave the rest to your imagination. <laughs> now, you'll probably think, well, surely that never happened, but I'm sure those of you that know me know that that's the kind of thing I do. I'm a bit wacky and tend to do sort of uh, outrageous things. But you know, the Bible, when you look at it, is full of outrageous things. You know, God often, chooses the wacky, the bizarre, the totally unbelievable, the things that, you know, you and I would never think of doing in a month of Sundays. And this morning, we're going to be thinking about the story of David and Goliath, another unbelievable story, a story which God uses things that, you know, we perhaps think, well, that'll never work. You know, it's something that just won't happen. You know, when you look at many of the stories in the Bible, you can see that God often works in very, very unusual ways, turning water into wine, the feeding of the 5,000, the way that uh, he got the Gideon and the Israelites to march around the, the city of Jericho with just some trumpets and the walls all fell down. So I think we want to remember this morning that God is a, a God of often the unconventional, and I think sometimes as Christians, we need to 
trust that really God will have all the answers, however bizarre or outlandish they might uh, they might be. So let's just sort of hold that thought in our mind now as uh, Stephanie um, reads us the story of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel, verse 17, no, it's 1 Samuel, chapter 17, 32 to 49. Don't worry about a thing, David told him. I'll take care of this Philistine. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. How can a kid like you fight with a man like that? You are only a boy and he has been in the army since he was a boy. But David persisted. When I am taking care of my father's sheep, he said, and a lion or a bear comes and grabs a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and take the lamb from its mouth. If it turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this heathen Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the claws and teeth of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. Oh, Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armour of bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can, I can hardly move, he exclaimed, and took them off again. Then he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag and, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, started across to Goliath. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this nice little red-cheeked boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David shouted in reply, you come to me with a sword and a spear, and I come to you in the name of the Lord of the armies of heaven and of Israel, the very God whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And Israel will learn that the Lord does not depend on weapons to fulfill his plans. He works without regard to human means. He will give you to us. As Goliath approached, David ran out to meet him and reaching into his shepherd's bag, took out a stone, hurled it from his sling, and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and then the man fell on his face to the ground. Thank and you. Uh, God for his word. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Um, those words uh, that the Lord will conquer you, and just reminds us that it's God that is in charge. And our next uh, song takes up that scene that salvation belongs to our God.
I want us to uh, date, as I say, to think about this uh, story of David and Goliath, probably one of the most famous Bible stories that uh, there was. And uh, we've got here the story of the, uh, the Philistines uh, attacking the, the Israelites who were led by King Saul. And uh, David's older brothers were fighting in the uh, Israelite army. And David's father had sent uh, uh, David to bring them some food to keep them going whilst the, the battle was going on. The first thing I think about this story is that uh, each one of us has got giants in our lives to overcome. Because the Israelites were really up against it here. They'd got this great nine foot six uh, champion, Goliath, who was built like a tank. And it seemed almost an impossible situation as to how the Israelites were going to defeat him. And of course, to make things worse, Goliath was taunting the Israelites. I don't know about you, when I look at my life, I can think of many Goliath's problems and enemies and things that seem almost impossible to to deal with. And many of them seem almost invincible, don't they? Impossible to overcome. And usually we try and sort of deal with problems and things on our own strength instead of seeking God's help. And I think this story is a good example of how we need to remember that however impossible situations might be, that God is on our side, isn't he? And it's God that finally works things out at the very end of this, uh, this story. I was talking to uh, somebody a while ago about this uh, story, and we got to talking about uh, what happened in it. And uh, the person I was talking to pointed out to me, and I hadn't actually noticed this before, that nowhere does it say that God told David to go off and to, to, fill, to fight the Philistines. He kind of just, uh, it was just arrived on the scene, hadn't he, to help the, uh, uh, the Israelites and to give them some food. But whilst he was there, he saw the situation that the Israelites were in. And he was moved by what he saw and put himself forward to try and, uh, and help the situation. You know, very often as Christians, we prefer to wait and be told what to do by God instead of taking the initiative for ourselves. You know, so often we, we, we can look around and see that things aren't quite right. You know, there might be injustice, somebody in need, something that needs, uh, needs sorting out. And we sort of think, well, I'm going to wait until God tells me to do something about this. But here's a good example of David who, who took the initiative. He could see things were not going well for the Israelites. And he stood up and he faced Goliath. And it's important, I think, that as believers, we need to stand up for our faith. You know, I think even more today, we're living in a world where Christians are being persecuted and are up against the uh, evil forces of this dark world. And I believe that God really wants us to stand up and protect him and protect our faith and step out and take risks for God in the world that we live today. The other thing I think that this passage teaches us is that God uses ordinary people and he uses ordinary things, ordinary situations to overcome the things of this world. Let's think about ordinary people to start with. When David stepped up to volunteer to uh, oppose Goliath, he was put down, wasn't he? Saul told him, well, look, you know, you're just a boy. You couldn't possibly stand up to this uh, nine foot six uh, Philistine. David was the, the very youngest of the brothers. You know, he was a shepherd, wasn't he? His job was just to look after the sheep. And, you know, he wasn't considered old enough to uh, get involved in combat at all. But somehow, God gave David 
the wherewithal to stand up and to offer the help that was needed. You know, it's a good example, isn't it, of the way that God uses ordinary people, people that the world perhaps wouldn't give a second thought to, to do extraordinary things. If you read those words in, uh, in 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, God, Paul talks about how God uses the foolish things, the ordinary things of this world, to achieve his purposes. As well as ordinary people, God uses ordinary things. You know, it's amazing, isn't it, that it was a stone in a sling that caused the downfall of Goliath and the defeat of the Philistine army. You remember that to start with, David was persuaded to put on the army, the armor that everybody else was wearing, because this was the usual tried and tested method, wasn't it, of going into battle. You know, you never went into battle unless you were fully kitted out with the, with the statutory armor. But of course, David was quite small, wasn't he? So of course, when he put the armor on, it was about 10 sizes too big for him. And, you know, he was falling all over the place. And he said, look, you know, this isn't gonna work. He said, look, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm never gonna be able to, to do anything wearing this, uh, this, uh, this armor. And he decided that it was just not any good for him in this particular situations. Well, I'm going to ask you a, a question now. We're thinking today about new and old ways of doing things. So how many Baptists and Methodists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is the whole congregation. The minister sits back and does absolutely nothing regarding the work. A light bulb changing committee is formed to check into light bulbs. Another committee is formed that actually goes about the changing of the light bulb. The women of the church organize a faith supper and the deacons and the church leaders sit around and discuss how good the old light bulb used to be. You know, it's easy, isn't it, to sort of fluff around and sort of say, well, well, you know, we've always done it that way. You know, it's always worked in the past. You know, let's, let's, let's do it like that. Again, let's do it next time. We've always done it that way. I know people at work used to say that to me, you know, when we're trying to bring some new changes and things into things. You know, the fact is we all like our tried and tested methods of doing things. And that not only applies to our sort of everyday lives, but it also applies to the way that we do God's work as well. But, I think sometimes God wants us to use the unconventional methods to achieve his purpose. Just because we've always done it that way, doesn't that necessarily mean it's the way that it can't, it can be done in, in a different way. I know many times recently, and we've been having discussions about this at our, our deacons and church leaders meeting, that, you know, this, a pandemic this time when we've perhaps been on zoom it's a time to reflect and to think about how we do church differently and perhaps that might mean stopping doing some of the things that we've been doing for the last number of years it might be perhaps doing something in a in a different way stopping something and doing something new maybe and seeking God's guidance more as to what we need to be doing next. I honestly, personally, don't think that church is ever going to be the same again, isn't it? And I think we've got to recognise that, you know, God is leading us into a new situation. He might be asking us to do something new, something that we've never even thought about before, or... He might be asking us to do something that we have been doing, but to do it in a completely new way. You know, God used the, uh, God got David to use the normal tools of his trade to defeat Goliath. A few stones and a sling, which he would normally use to defend against the 
the sheep against the attacks of the wild animals. And I think it also points out that God doesn't want us to use any special equipment or uh, lots and lots of resources to do the things that he wants us to do. We just need to give the things that he's given us. You know, it's no good thinking, well, we could only do this if only we had this or if we only had that or, you know, we haven't got enough money or enough children or enough people or whatever it is we, we don't think we've got enough of. You know, this, this story, I think, demonstrates that God uses very, very little to achieve a great deal. David was confident that the sling and the stone would be sufficient to defeat Goliath. The final thing is that winning one battle leads us into doing even greater things. And if you think, you know, this was the very start, wasn't it, of David's uh, work that he did for God. He became recognized by Saul, and that led to doing bigger and better things for God. You know, we forget that David wasn't born into a royal family, but he was chosen by God and God made him into a king. And although David wasn't perfect and during his reign, he made many, many grave mistakes along the way. But, you know, despite all the many things that David did wrong, God forgave him and he picked him up and enabled him to go on. You know, none of us are perfect, are we? And I'm sure every day we make lots of mistakes and we go off the rails and try and do things in our own strength or in our own way, rather than the things that God actually wants us to do. But the old saying, I think, is true, isn't it? That the person who never makes mistakes never does anything. You know, if we don't try anything, we don't know whether it's going to work or not, do we? David trusted in God's track record and his promises. And because of this, God did great things through him. You know, the question I think today is, do you believe that God's got great things in store for you? Do you believe that God's got great things still in store for us here at Kingsthorpe? You know, God founded the Baptist Church nearly 200 years ago. The Methodists, not quite so long ago. But in all cases, we've seen evidence of God's hand at work in the past. And I believe he's going to continue to work with us as we move forward into the next stage of God's plan. I just want to read in closing, a couple of verses from Isaiah and chapter 43, which I think just sums up really what uh, God wants us to do and the direction he wants us to, to lead in. Isaiah says this, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Amen. Before we uh, come to communion, I'm just going to uh, spend a few moments in, uh, in prayer, just bringing before us uh, the needs of our congregation here. Pray for those who are not with us today. It's quite a few away on, uh, on holiday this week. And uh, also to, to pray, I think, for the world in which we live. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for that reminder that you are our refuge, our strength, the one that uh, can defeat us from all of the problems and the, uh, the difficulties, Father, of this world in which we live. We just pray, Lord, this morning that you might uh, increase our faith. Help us, Father, to have that kind of insight that David had, that confidence that David had in you, that he knew that by trusting in you, 
and by relying on God's salvation that he would be able to overcome his enemy. And Father, we do live in a world at the moment, Lord, where Satan seems to be running rampant at the moment. We do pray, Lord, for your protection. We pray, Father, for your help in this troubled world. The things, Lord, that are going on, Father, on which we seem to have no control. But we thank you, Father, for the confidence that we can have in you. That salvation belongs to our God. Father, today we just pray for ourselves and for others that have Goliath's, Lord, problems in their lives, Father, that seem impossible to overcome. We pray, Father, for those who are sick, those who are feeling depressed at the moment, those that are finding life difficult, those who are bereaved, Father, at this time, those that are uncertain about their future. Lord, we just bring all those, Lord, before us, before you now. We just take a moment, Lord, to name individuals, Father, silently before you. Those that we know, Lord, are in real dire need, Lord, of a touch from your hand. We pray too, Father, for those that are not with us today. We thank you, Lord, for those who are able to be away on holiday at the moment. We just pray, Lord, that it might be a time of great refreshing and renewal, Father, for them. We ask, Lord, that you might be with them and that when they come back, Lord, you, you might have perhaps just given them some fresh energy and some fresh insight, Lord, to help as we move forward together. And finally, Lord, I just want to pray for us as a congregation. Father, we want to thank you for your great track record here at Kingsthorpe. The way, Father, you've uh, led our fellowships individually, Lord, and in recent years together. And we just pray, Lord, for your guidance as we move forward now. You'll show us, Lord, the things, Father, that you want us to do. The things, Lord, that you may want us to stop doing. And we just pray, Lord, that you might increase our faith in you and provide a platform, Lord, to spread your gospel to those around us, Lord. Just be with us, Father. Send your spirit, Father, upon our fellowship now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Adrian uh, leads us in our communion uh, time as we share the bread and wine together, I've uh, chosen a, a song I'm sure some of you may not have heard before, actually. I think it's quite a beautiful song, and it just tells about the sacrifice that Jesus made upon the cross and you know how we just need to come before him as we are a frame so beautifully formed A frame so beautifully formed Brought to life by God's own breath Crafted from the planet's dust God's own image carved in flesh But not one righteous man remains Perfection lost and beauty stained Far from the safety of God's side Innocence traded for a lie All my shame All I failed to be
yet scarred with misery and pain. But underneath this brokenness, I'll make a signature. And only your redeeming love can pay the debt we can't afford. Salvation worked by your own hand. Your broken workmanship was stored. We come now then to gather, remembering the past, gathering with the bread and the wine. Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. As we gather, Gracious God, who became flesh in the person of Jesus, be Emmanuel for us now. Turn our thoughts and our hearts to the reasons for this part of our worship, so we might reflect on the reason you came. For you came to us as a child destined for the cross. Help us to remember the story of the last stuff. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with the disciples in the upper room and shared the Passover meal, the old way. But then Jesus took bread and gave thanks new way. So we too give thanks. Dear Lord, all this bread, the produce of your creation, and the work of human hands, we give you our thanks. And we thank you deeply for Jesus, our brother and our Lord. That night after giving thanks, Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. So we too break bread and share the loaf as sisters and brothers in Christ. Let us share the bread together. 
And after supper, Jesus took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new relationship with God, sealed with my blood for the forgiveness of sins. So before drinking, let us together give thanks for this cup. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this symbol of your sacrifice. When you were poured out and your life drained for our sins, Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this earth as a pure child and for dying a blameless man so that we sinners might once more be innocent in the sight of God. Now we drink the cup of the new relationship with God made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus. Let us drink the cup. for this act of remembrance and celebration for all you have done. We thank you that the empty cross shows your victory and gives us eternal hope through the new covenant of your body and blood. We pray these things in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. now sing together our final song, I'll go in the strength of the Lord. Uh, let's just pray father we just pray now that as we uh, go from here or uh, we'll go to do whatever we're going to do now lord that we shall go yes i think it's all three times it? to go in the strength of the lord 
Father, just bless us and keep us in your safe keeping. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say the grace together and unmute ourselves. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all forever and Amen. Messages out this week, didn't they? Who? They didn't give any notices out. Notices now are prayer on Wednesday and Friday at 11. Sunday morning next week, 27th of June, there will be a Zoom service here at 11 as usual, which I'm leading next week. I know that uh, all the service. We learned that uh, Lois still has some uh, plants and various things just to uh, collect and contribute to Christian aid. How much have we got so far, Christian aid, uh, Lois? A bit over 950. So uh, it's really good to uh, hear that uh, we're supporting that through uh, growing in our gardens. <laughs> so. Uh, are there any other notices anybody wishes to bring this morning? Not them. But, uh, share greetings and uh, carry on and enjoy the rest of our day. All right. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. We know them too, don't you? Yes, well, have a good week. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Daniel. Bye, friend. Bye, bye, Daniel. Bye, family. He'll soon be a year old, Stella, won't he? No, it's not too apt to sort of disappear. He'll soon. Wycliffe will soon be a year old. Yeah. Bye. Next month, in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Next month. Wow. <laughs> for a few, three weeks time maybe yeah <laughs> three weeks time yeah time has flown so fast it's gone so quickly hasn't it bye 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 bye